Welcome back. You are listening to Nate the Hate on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Be sure to like the episode and subscribe to the channel if you have not already. And with that, I'd like to welcome in my co-host, Modern Vintage Gamer. Hello, Nate. It's great to be here. Happy New Year. Welcome to 2023. We are back with our first episode of the year. And uh, how are you feeling about this year as far as you know, the landscape of video games, 2023? I feel like we're going to have a lot of episodes and a lot of content this year. Hey, how are you feeling? Yeah, I think it's going to be a banner year for the channel as well as the industry. And I think one of the companies who's going to be leading that charge is the company we're going to talk about today, and that is Microsoft and the Xbox, along with the Game Pass ecosystem that they have been building and cultivating over the last couple of years. But before we get into today's topic, first, we have to give a shout out to two members whom this episode is dedicated to. And those two are Shamsa and the Zelda Sensei, both of whom generously donated $100 to support the channel. And if you'd like to support the channel, we have a Streamlabs link in the description below. Donate any dollar amount, ask a question, we'll answer it at the end of the episode. Donate $100 or more, and we will dedicate the episode to you. And today's episode is once again dedicated to Shamsa and the Zelda Sensei. But yes, for 2023, I believe Microsoft of the three console manufacturers is the most exciting company to watch over the calendar year. And largely that is because 2020, 2021, and 2022 were slow years for the Xbox. Though we had some major releases with Forza Horizon 5, Halo Infinite, Flight Simulator, Pentiment, there was no real big banger in terms of a AAA release in the entirety of 2022 and that has naturally led expectations going into 2023 to be stratospherically high where everyone is expecting microsoft to deliver the goods and finally get the ball rolling in terms of momentum when it comes to software releases now i don't think 2023 is going to be the best year for the Xbox Series line of hardware, nor do I think it's going to be the best year for Game Pass and Microsoft. I think 2023 is going to be the year we finally start to see some movement. The car is going to leave the garage. We're going to hit some of those mile markers that are software releases, and we're going to see what Microsoft has been building towards over the last couple of years with this hardware line, as well as what Game Pass can offer when it comes to first party support. If 2023 does not deliver on those promises, then I would have some serious concern with the Xbox and Microsoft moving forward. But right now, here in January, I am hopeful, I am excited, and I think Microsoft is going to be the company that the gaming community is going to be discussing very heavily over the course of the next 12 months. Nate, I think you absolutely nailed it with your little summary there of how I think Microsoft is going to go this year. Last year, like you said, 2021, 2022 were not particularly great years. There was some highlights in 2021, of course. Forza Horizon 5, Halo Infinite came out, even though it didn't release in a great state. It has since gotten a little better, I will say. Psychonauts was another game that came out, Flight Simulator. So it wasn't a bad year, 2021. 2022 was a really, really tough year for Microsoft. I felt like they never got any traction or any momentum whatsoever. There were some little moments, I will say, when when Pentiment was released and a game that I personally didn't like, but I know was uh, praised uh, by many. And that is the game High on Life, which kind of ended... 2022 but there was a lot of questions being asked i know that we've had conversations about microsoft last year and we kind of felt like it was a a growing year a regrouping almost because you know they they were coming off the acquisition of bethesda they had also acquired other studios during during 2021 and previously and we just kind of felt like a lot of these studios Although there were some big announcements that were made, we were just thinking that most of them are just heads down, getting things ready, getting things done. And 
here we are. It's 2023. And I agree with you. I don't think this year is going to be their best year ever because that would be, that's a pretty big statement, especially when we think about the 360 era of games where they had some absolute banger years where they had games like Forza and Halo and Fable uh, and Gears of War. I mean, you know, there's some big years in Microsoft's history. 2023 is, you're right, the, the car has left the garage and I think we're going to see some pretty interesting stuff from Microsoft. This is, I believe this is the start of a very couple of fruitful years for them where they start to show us all the things they've promised us over the last couple of years. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. Yes, this is 2023 is the moment for Microsoft to really sell the Xbox and Game Pass as a meaningful initiative to the consumer. Because right now, the Xbox series has been surviving largely on Game Pass. They haven't had to release a major game. And Forza Horizon 5 and Halo have certainly done some heavy lifting. But you can only rely on two games for so long before the community and the casual market begins to hunger for something new. And luckily, the first half of 2023 right now seems poised to deliver some hearty software meals. Mm -hmm. And we're going to start today's episode with Game Pass because this is such an important pillar for the Xbox Series line of hardware. And it's also a key structure for Microsoft as a company when it comes to the Xbox line. Game Pass subscriptions, as Phil Spencer put last year, have somewhat stagnated, and they even acknowledge that is due to a lack of AAA software support. And he's absolutely correct about that. When you look at 2022's lineup, how could you not expect Game Pass subscriptions to stagnate? No one was going to subscribe to play Pentiment, though it was one of my favorite games of 2022. I can recognize that the game was inherently niche. Mm -hmm. And that it's not, and it was also $20. So being a cheap game and a niche game isn't exactly the formula to drive subscriptions to your game rental service. You need major releases. And third party wise, Microsoft is looking to kickstart 2023 in a major way. Just this month, we have Persona 3 Portable, Persona 4 Golden, Monster Hunter Rise. And then in February, we have Atomic Hearts. And in March, we have Wo Long Fallen Dynasty. Now, these are all Japanese games. They're coming to Game Pass day one. And I feel as though that may set the tone for Game Pass in 2023. We're going to see more ambitious partnerships with Japanese publishers. More games from Atlas, Sega. Maybe more from Bandai Namco. Maybe Capcom gets involved as well. We have seen some of their games come to Game Pass in the past, like Resident Evil 7. And we know that Sony prevented Resident Evil Village from coming to Game Pass in those leaked documents. But there's a lot of other companies out, you know, in Japan, China, which is an emerging market. And if Microsoft is able to leverage worldwide appeal with the Game Pass as a service in 2023, that can only help the service thrive and grow and become a worldwide appealing subscription model. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely going to be a big year for them. And I think this is their big push for Game Pass, especially with some big titles coming. This is what they've always wanted, to have these big AAA games ready to go on Game Pass day one to really get people excited about the service and get people re-upping their subscription if they kind of decided they would, um, you know, stop the the service for a while and what have you. But yeah, look, they're making, at least as of, you know, January of 2023, they're making all the right moves. And hopefully, you know, none of these releases that we're all anticipating kind of, decide to shift in terms of timeline. But I think there's a confidence around Microsoft at the moment. They've started this year out talking, you know, teasing 2023 and and some of the things that we can expect. 
And that kind of air of confidence I haven't seen from from Xbox in in a while. So look, I, I think it's going to be a big year for them. I do expect that Game Pass will continue to dominate and really become front and center the most important thing they have in their arsenal, in their toolbox. And yeah, I uh, I am very very happy to see this because it's been it's been quite a while with with you know it's been kind of drought for a long long time and. Now we're starting to see the fruits of those labors, and I'm I'm ex- I'm here for it, and I'm excited about it. Yeah, one thing that we saw from Game Pass, especially in 2022, is that it never really had a major third party day one release. Like, yes, we had MLB The Show, which now has simply become an expectation. Yeah, it, this would now be the third year of it coming to Game Pass on day one, but you saw other. Big games, even for 2023, we see titles like Dead Space Remake. You have Resident Evil 4 Remake. And when you look at some of the games that have been announced this year for, you know, from third party publishing partners, there's always that expectation of. Could Microsoft get this as a Game Pass day one release? And, you know, in some cases, they have been able to secure some major games over the course of the last several years, we can go all the way back to the Series X launch where they had Yakuza like a dragon day one game yep. pass. And that was a huge get. It was an acquisition for the service that no one was really expecting for them to get a Yakuza game right there day one on the Xbox of all platforms. And it took people by surprise. And since then, Sega has been a very generous partner with Game Pass. We have the entire Yakuza saga on game pass it actually left and came back which means sega and microsoft were liking the numbers that they were seeing as far as engagement Mm -hmm. and they want to bring back to please fans and now that we have the persona franchise with three four and five all on game pass or soon to be on game pass to me that would indicate that microsoft is having discussions or at least wants the xbox on the radar for when it comes time to bring Persona 6 to market. And last year, when we were giving predictions for Sony, my prediction was that Persona 6 would remain a PlayStation exclusive. Now, having these three Persona games go full-on multi-platform, be it Switch, Xbox, PC, as well as the PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5, I wouldn't be too surprised if Persona 6 maybe is still timed exclusive for the PlayStation 5 and then finds its way to the Xbox, be it six months or 12 months later. Because if you're Microsoft, you want to use the opportunity you've been given with these three Persona games to prove to Atlas that there is a market here for future Persona products and that the base wants to support your releases and if they can do that through persona 5 3 and 4 if you're atlas why would you not want to release your game on a platform that is now thriving and you're potentially also catering to a new audience on the xbox these are gamers that may not own a playstation they may never have played a persona game until it came to game pass and as a publisher you want your franchise to thrive and grow. So if you have found a new audience on the Xbox, when it comes time for Persona 6, this might be a good platform to consider. So one of my predictions for 2023 is that if Persona 6 does get announced, I think the Xbox could potentially be announced alongside the PlayStation. Yeah, I could definitely see that. And I think you're right about what you're saying about opening it up to a new audience as well, especially with the Series S that is of a good price point, $299. I've seen it as low as $250 over the holidays. And it's selling quite well in Asian countries as well, in, J- in Japan. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's a, that's a pretty good prediction, Nate. And, um, you know, I'm here for it. I think I'm excited about Game Pass this year. You know, I, I've... I've had my reservations about the service. I've definitely criticized it in the past. I will say that 
I had Game Pass for 12 months and then I just let it lapse. I didn't really care about it, but I've since re-upped on it uh, because I am expecting, and I think most of us are, some big things this year. And, you know, I'm hopeful that we'll start to see those things here pretty soon in the next couple of months. And I'm not saying every single month there'll be a massive Game Pass release, but I do think Microsoft has made a lot of good moves to ensure that Game Pass is well taken care of this year. Yes, and one of the announcements that shook a lot of people happened in June of 2022 when Microsoft was the venue of choice for Hollow Knight Silk Song to make its triumphant resurrection. And then they announced it would be a day one Game Pass release, something I'm sure not many people are expecting, considering the first game was a shadow drop on the Nintendo Switch following their June Direct several years ago. So even though it's an indie game, it's one of those games I believe a lot of people do view as a big release. And this is exactly the type of get that we've seen Microsoft actively pursue. You Mm -hmm. want the game that's going to be highly talked about, that's going to create waves in the online community, you know, community where it's going to be talked about, where it's going to have positive word of mouth. And you can look at the very recent release of High on Life, a game you personally did not enjoy, one that I thoroughly enjoyed. But look at how much communication, how much talk there was around this game, be it positive or negative. There was also the meme aspect where this game was constantly clipped and shared on TikTok and other social media. And that is exactly what you want to see if you're both Microsoft, not only for Game Pass, but also for the publisher. Because if you're the publisher of this game and you're seeing this level of engagement, it's promising because Mm -hmm. people could be subscribing to Game Pass to test out your game and then they're buying the game for 10% off the full price due to that perk that Game Pass offers. And that's a win. It's a win for everybody involved, the consumer, Microsoft, as well as the publisher. So when you have a game like Hollow Knight Silk Song coming to the platform, yes, it's not AAA, but it's a quality release. And that's a nice little, you know, filler release in your Game Pass lineup where maybe you don't have a major first party game during that month. And maybe there's no AAA third party game. But if you have the biggest indie game coming out within you know, the next six months on your service day one. That's a net win. And that type of game could potentially drive subscribers to the service when it's paired with other games like Persona 3 and 4, Monster Hunter, Wolong Dynasty, Atomic Hearts. All of them play a role to lure the customer in. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, you, you, you nailed it. Game Pass is uh, is big news, and yeah, I think this year we we expect big things, and I think Microsoft will deliver on that. It's 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 all it's all primed and ready to go. There's the only way that this this cannot happen is if there's some major delays that happen, and mm-hmm. I mean, look, you know, delays have have crippled video games over the last few years. But I think this year, I mean, there may be a, some slippage here and there, Nate, but I think generally speaking, most most things are, uh, are locked into place. Would you agree? Yeah, generally speaking, yes. Yeah. I mean, I, there's probably going to be some slippage here and there. You know, something may may d- drop out a couple of months or, or whatever, a couple of weeks. Um, but I wouldn't expect a Halo Infinite level of delay going forward, where basically they oh. delayed it an entire year. Uh, Red uh, Starfield and and Redfall, we've already experienced that. I think those games are close to completion, and we will see them um, this year, no doubt, without without question. Yes, and now for twenty twenty three, as we discussed with Game Pass, that. You know, it's going to be a focal point for Microsoft. Do you think this could potentially be the strongest year that we've seen in terms of third party and indie content? Or do you think it may 
struggle a little bit compared to what we had seen in 2020, 2021, and even 2022, because we did see major releases across those years. And, you know, we actively know that Sony is trying to prevent games from coming to Game Pass, and they've become a little more aggressive with that tactic as Game Pass has grown in subscription numbers. So could that potentially, in your opinion, be a detriment to Game Pass moving forward as we see games at the caliber of, be it Resident Evil 4 Remake, Mm -hmm. bypassing the service? Yeah, that's a that's a really hard question to answer. I mean, I think there's going to be some big third party announcements on Game Pass this year, but will it be their best year for third parties? I don't think so, um, and I don't necessarily have any any real reason to say that. But I just feel like the last few years have actually been pretty decent as far as third parties but of course you know we do have persona coming up and we have some games that you mentioned as well but look i think the capcom thing is still not quite there yet as far as you know the relationship that microsoft has with capcom and bringing those games to game pass obviously we know about square Enix's history with with microsoft it's a little all over the place some things seem to end up on this will end up on the service and some some things will never come to xbox it seems like so it's it's really hard to answer that i think um but look i think microsoft is going to continue to push you know they're, they're going to continue to make inroads in all facets of um the service to try to get as much value as they can out of it i think they've already made some pretty good moves that we already know about and hopefully we'll get some surprises this year of some some bigger third party announcements. But it's hard to really think that it's going to be that successful for them this year. I do think that there's a tendency for third parties to pivot more towards Sony in that in that aspect. But you know, hopefully I'm proven wrong. Hopefully Capcom does come to the table with some big Game Pass announcements this year. That would be that'd be pretty awesome to see. Yes. And what would you say would be your unexpected third party announcement for Microsoft in 2023? As I kind of talked about earlier, I wouldn't be surprised if Atlas announced intentions to bring Persona 6 Mm -hmm. to the Xbox series and as well as the PlayStation line of systems. What would be your surprise? Like, wow, I can't believe that game is going multi-platform or that they are making a Xbox version of that franchise now. Oh, that's a that's the million dollar question. Persona Six is a is a good one. Um, oh, what what else is what else is big that's coming out this year? I know we've got you know, a couple of releases in February, but I mean I don't expect anything anything of that you know to come to Game Pass. I do like Persona though. That's that's a good one, Nate. I think you're right. I think you know Atlas has definitely got some momentum in in Game Pass, and uh, I could see I could see Persona Six being a a good pick. I'm not trying to fence it, but like it's hard for really to uh, to really come <laughs> up with something else that I I feel like makes sense. You know, um, uh, I mean, uh, look, there's also the the big elephant in the room, and that's the ABK deal. And I know we're going to talk about that separately, but. You know, all of a sudden, third-party games become first-party games. You know what I mean? So um, I, I wonder if that will also come into play at some point. Uh, let's see if I can let's see if I can pivot into a little more open. Um, well, let's say like Elden Ring. There is the expectation that they could potentially have an expansion come out in the second half of this year, knowing how important that IP proved. Mm-hmm. In 2022, winning Game of the Year, being you know almost a genre-defying and generation-defining release, and Microsoft did have the marketing of that game initially. Yes, it the did. Game was announced on the Xbox show floor. Mm-hmm. Could maybe Microsoft go to FromSoft and Bandai Namco and say, "Hey, that DLC is coming out. We want to make it a Game Pass perk, or we want Elden Ring on Game Pass right around the time the expansion releases." And, you know, maybe Game Pass subscribers get 10% off the expansion. Just even that type of maneuver, do you think Microsoft may be able to do something like that for Game Pass and for third-party announcements to really show their commitment to the service and drive people to it? I 
I can't see Elden Ring DLC as a thing. And, and again, I don't have a rhyme or reason for it. It just doesn't feel right to me. Um, here's here's a random one. I, I, I took a look at um, up and coming third part, third person or third party games. Um, what about like Exo Primal? It's a Capcom game, right? It is a Capcom game. And when you look at the nature of it being like a multiplayer driven title, it kind of suits that feel of Game Pass where. Like know, if Capcom's like, OK, Xbox, we're, we're going to work with you guys. We're going to help you. You know, we're going to get something on Game Pass. Here's Exo Primal. <laughs> I could see that. Yeah, I, I could, could see that. that type of release actually feels as though it's a good fit for Game Pass only because it's it's an unproven entity at this point and the focus on multiplayer as previously said suits game pass because you more than likely know a couple of people with a game pass so you all download it you play it for a weekend and if you if it clicks for you mm-hmm. you say okay we're going to stick with this long term if you didn't enjoy it just simply uninstall it yep and That's i mean pick. frankly based on what we've seen of the game thus far i feel as though that will be a tough sell for capcom in general so game mm-hmm. pass at least gives them a guaranteed payday from microsoft of you know x amount and then it allows them for the game pass community to engage with it then you can have a larger subset of streamers potentially give the game that level of marketing and that could branch out into you know, a successful release. Whereas I think people are going to look at the game from the onset and say, is that really a game I want to spend 60 or $70 on when I'm not sure I'm going to like the concept of it. The premise seems a little iffy to me. Why isn't this dino crisis? So get it in the hands of people any way you can. And if Microsoft is willing to give you a little bit of money, take it, help that, you know, go against your development cost a bit. And Hey, throw it out there. You might find a you might find success. Take the gamble. Roll the dice. Yeah, it could be good. And it kind of plays into Microsoft's desire to take some risks with the Game Pass. And you can't just pursue what you perceive as the next big thing. You have to go out there and say, this game has potential. Let's bring it over. And if it works out for us, great. If it doesn't, hey, yeah, we have I some mean, other big, we have other big games on the service as well. We already saw that with High on Life last year. I mean, yeah, I that, mean that game really just kind of stood above <laughs> everything else. Again, I don't like the game, but I also acknowledge that you know it did really well. I think it, it exceeded everyone's expectations. Mm-hmm. So there's definitely you know room for those types of games where. It's an it's a bit of an unknown quantity. You're not really sure what you're getting, but you know all you need to do is just press install on your controller and then come back and and start playing. That you don't really need to do anything else. So, look, there's definitely a lot of value in in these kind of unknown IPs or franchise or something new, some new franchise or some some risk that that developers take. Game Pass is a great platform for that because, you know, a lot of people yes. are going to take a look at your game. Yeah, I mean, you can even look at Plague Tale Requiem last year. This was a sequel to a great game, by the way. It is a fantastic game. If you haven't played it, definitely give it a look. By far, one of the best games of 2022. And even though a game, it came to Game Pass, it feels as though the game was still... It flew under radar. Mm-hmm surprisingly because the first game was well received so it felt as though when microsoft announced rec room for game pass it was going to be that major major release for the service and the game just didn't feel as though it had that hype when it launched and it slowly built up as the year got closer to its conclusion because it started to find itself in game of the year discussions it was nominated for game of the year at the game awards And that's another strength of Game Pass is that when those conversations happen, people start to search for the game. They want to learn more about it. You see it's on Game Pass. You're going to go, you know, it's like, oh, I have that. I'm going to go give it a look. I didn't know it was on the service. So that's another good example of Microsoft going out there and getting a game that not many people expected them to get for the service. And, you know, I think it's more of a long burner where it's going to find success on the service in the long term if it didn't find it in the immediate because 
initially I wasn't going to give the game a look, but because it was on Game Pass, I was like, oh, let me see how good these visuals really are on the Series X. Booted the game up. I was like, okay, this game actually looks ridiculous. And then the story, the atmosphere, the characters, the music, the gameplay all hooked me almost immediately. And I immersed myself in that world all the way to completion. And I loved every second of it. And I I know the first game was on Game Pass at one point. I kind of wish it were there now so I could go back and give that game a look because I never played the first game. So Microsoft, make the deal. Bring it back. So, yeah, overall, I mean, I think Game Pass is going to have a strong year, at least, you know, third party and indie wise. We are intentionally avoiding the first party stuff. We're going to come back to that in the second half of this episode. But as our lead into that, we have to naturally bring up the Activision Blizzard deal. And let's just get the big question out of the way. Is it going to go through? Yes, the deal will absolutely go through, Nate. It's it's really just a matter of of when at this point. It's a kind of a you know a formality at this point, really, that the ABK deal will happen. I know there's been some resistance over the last few months and everything like that, but look, the deal's done as far as I'm concerned, and I think that probably around uh, May June time frame, we should expect to hear that it's it's all done. What do you think? I agree with you that the deal will be approved. It will go through. As we've seen over the last couple of months, we have seen resistance from the FTC to block the deal. But every time they have the opportunity to present a case and reasoning as to why they want to prevent the deal, it always feels very unfounded. They have removed Nintendo from you know, the industry so they can make a better case of how this hurts the consumer. And Nintendo is, for some reason, a non-factor in these discussions. And when they tried to make the focus purely on Sony, that kind of shows you that they even they are aware that they don't have a good case. And a lot of the resistance is largely because the FTC didn't show any form of resistance or friction when the ZeniMax Bethesda deal went through with Microsoft. It was very smooth. And... It got some people talking of if you can go through an acquisition of that size with such little resistance, what won't the FTC let through? So now enter the Activision Blizzard deal and they want to show strength. They want to make a message to the tech industry of if you want to make these big deals, we are going to scrutinize it. We are going to investigate it. I just think the FTC chose poorly to use this particular acquisition deal as an example to flex on because their case largely relies on the EU and the CMA blocking it for their respective regions. And right now, there is no indication that that will happen. It seems as though the CMA and the EU will approve of this acquisition, and then the FTC is going to be left standing alone and they have no reason to block the deal. The FTC's job is to protect the consumer, and they have not illustrated how this hurts the consumer because Microsoft has come out repeatedly and said, we will give Call of Duty to PlayStation for 10 years. They have presented this contract, and Sony has gone silent on it. And the FTC and Sony's entire casing is, Microsoft is going to prevent us from having Call of Duty. Or right. they're going to put Call of Duty on Game Pass Day 1, and that would mean that the Call of Duty base has no reason to invest and buy the game on our platform. And Microsoft has come out very publicly and said, we've offered them years of access to the game. And when 10 years are up, I mean, we're talking late 2030s at this point, we can revisit yeah. and we can extend that contract more. and. Microsoft, be it Matt Booty, Phil Spencer, or whomever at the company has said time and time again that they view Call of Duty similarly as they view it to Minecraft. And Minecraft is on every platform that Microsoft can get it on. So a lot of it just feels as though the FTC is reacting to Microsoft 
and what Microsoft was in the 90s, a very, for lack of a better word, evil yeah. corporation. They bought up companies and closed them down. They were, you know, ruthless. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, Microsoft has, has been that big, bad behemoth company for so, so many years, and they've got a track record of antitrust issues. They've got a track record of buying big companies or buying buying companies and running them into the ground. We've seen what happened with Mixer. Skype hasn't really been that successful for them. They own LinkedIn. So, yeah, I think you're right. I think the FTC in general, basically, as is their right to do so, decided that they would investigate this further and try to put a stop to, not not a stop to the acquisition, but put the brakes on so they can take a look at this and scrutinize it a lot closer. But at the end of the day, like you said, there's not really anything compelling. There's not really anything there that is going to stop this deal from happening. And look, Sony, as far as the 10-year deal and them not accepting it or going quiet or whatever the latest on that is, look, it's not going to be Phil Spencer and Jim Ryan in 10 years. I'd be very surprised if either of them are still <laughs> running the show at their respective companies. It's going to be someone else. Mm-hmm. And those types of deals can be and can and will be renegotiated as as they come up. So, you know, yes. I think at the end of the day, Microsoft is giving all the answers that really will ensure that this deal goes through. And I don't believe that the FTC is really that serious about stopping this deal. I think it's happening. Yeah. Like, as I was saying, I think this is really just a, it's just a show of strength that they want to send to the entire industry of, you can't come in with these huge deals and expect it just to go smooth. Yeah. We're going to investigate and we have to show strength at some point. Otherwise you're just going to have deals you know, happen all throughout the tech industry and you're going to potentially get closer to that monopoly that they are saying Microsoft has, even though Microsoft comes back and say, even with Activision, we still control less than 10% of the industry. Right. It's very minimal. And the Call of Duty point, which just is the key thing that's harped on from all the companies is in 10 years, who's to say Call of Duty is even a relevant franchise? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely had its ups and downs over the years. And look, it may not, may not be, you know, in 10 years from now. It may have really kind of outstayed its welcome by then. We don't really think that it's going to have changed much. I, I still feel like every year it's going to be the biggest selling video game. But you're right, Nate, things change. And in 10 years from now, there may be something new, something fresh that that's come along that's mm-hmm. basically eaten its lunch. Because Call of Duty has been around for a long, long time. And it took a long time for Call of Duty really to become the juggernaut that it did. Of course, yeah. There were so many false starts. Yeah, it took until Call of Duty 4, Modern Warfare, before the franchise really gained traction. I mean, how many people can... How many people remember Call of Duty 2 launching the Xbox 360 and people saying, well, it looks like an Xbox One game or Xbox 1.5 game? (laughs) Dude, I I remember that vividly because I got... I got that on launch, <laughs> um, but I, I remember the day when Modern Warfare came out. Yeah, oh my changed, god! Yeah, changed everything. It, it really did. It was uh, it was incredible. But yeah, yeah, I mean, Call of Duty. You know, it's been around for a long time. It took a long time for it to get started. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you know, I, I I definitely hear what you're saying. You know, it's it's the biggest thing right now. Is it going to be the biggest thing in ten years? I mean, it's still definitely going to be up there. You would think, it should but be. Uh, it yeah. may not be. Something else may be bigger around then yeah so i mean that's where i think ultimately the deal goes through what's going to be interesting is how immediate do we see the impacts of the deal if approved on the xbox series line of consoles in 2023 do you think we see an immediate release of activision blizzard games on game pass be it not necessarily i I won't even say games that are coming out this year across all platforms i'm going to mm-hmm. talk more back catalog so you know call of duty modern warfare back yeah. when the hd did will that go to game pass could we see microsoft reboot or restart the backwards compatibility initiative where we see activision blizzard games now come to the service that maybe 
weren't there due to licensing issues, ownership issues. And as we know, last year, Microsoft said we're done with backwards compatibility in terms of Xbox, Xbox 360 games. But now this could potentially open a lot of doors to a large catalog of Xbox and Xbox 360 games that are not backwards compatible on Series X. Yeah, I think there will be some level of Game Pass releases of the back catalog of Activision, Blizzard, King games on Game Pass. I mean, they could easily just drop Black Ops, you know, the Black Ops collection, right? Mm-hmm. And and call that, you know, a Game Pass thing or um, the Modern Warfare collection or what, whatever. So, yeah, the, I, I could see that happening. And if we look at what happened with the Bethesda deal, it was a very similar thing. The I think the day the deal actually was done and it was announced to be public, that it was actually a done deal. There was a similar thing where Bethesda dropped a bunch of back compat titles on on Game Pass. I could definitely see that happening. As far as reopening the backward compatibility, the emulation side, yes. I mean, it opens up new doors for them that they didn't have previously due to mm-hmm. potential licensing issues. So all of a sudden, if you have access to older games that you you know that ran on the 360 and the OG Xbox that uh, Activision IP that is still, you know, um, owned by them. I could see, I could definitely see those games coming back. I, I think, you know, Microsoft did exhaust their um, technical and and legal side to bring back as much as they could. But as soon as you start acquiring companies and acquiring publishers and studios, all of a sudden you have access to more. And I could definitely see them doing that. In this regard, so yeah, I, I think they'll they'll do both of those things. Uh, I'm not saying they'll be both ready day one as soon as the deal is inked and it's 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 a done deal, but I, I could see both of those initiatives happening on Game Pass going forward. Hey, this might be the only way we see Quake Four. Yeah, on Series yeah. X. Yep, because- I, I'm that, that's 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 a prime candidate for a game <laughs> that could come back. You know, because Activision published it, it soft developed it. Microsoft, if the deal goes through, would own both of them. So there really should be no nothing preventing that release from joining. Yep. Now, if the deal doesn't go through, do you think it reshapes Microsoft's 2023 in terms of software releases? Or do you think Microsoft kind of more or less has their plan set regardless of the deal going through. Do you think the deal is more so going to affect 2024 in the future? Yeah, I do. I mean, we kind of expect that as soon as the deal is done, there's going to be sweeping changes that happen. Mm-hmm. And I don't believe that's going to be the case. Look at look at what happened with Bethesda. That was a very slow process and it still is in in many ways it doesn't really feel like much has changed you know like bethesda is still doing their own thing although microsoft owns them now but the timelines around games haven't really changed nothing nothing really changed that much other than you know bethesda was a part of the conversation when xbox um, has their showcases now so i expect similar things here now there will be some Activision games that come to Game Pass this year. I think that that's part of the deal and something that Xbox desperately wants to do. You know, having Activision games on Game Pass is something that would really, you know, sweeten the deal. But I don't feel like we're going to see much as far as the um, the fruits of the acquisition, we'll say, until 2024, Very in very similar f- fashion as the Bethesda deal. When it happened... We didn't really hear much for a long time. And uh, mm-hmm. now we're starting to see, you know, um, the rewards of, of that of that pickup. Yeah, a lot of people like to use the Bethesda deal almost as proof that Microsoft has been poor at software output for the Xbox. Yeah. But when that conversation comes up, it's always neglecting that Loop went to PlayStation first as a timed exclusive. Ghostwire Tokyo, same example. 
And had they not honored those contracts and Microsoft were able to release those games as exclusives for the Xbox, Mm -hmm. all of a sudden the conversation for 2021 and 2022 in terms of Microsoft's output would be very different. And I mean, keep in and even Psychonauts too. These games all released while Microsoft controlled the developer or the publishing house. Yeah. And had those games been exclusive, the software conversation changes. And, and you know, Microsoft did the right thing by honoring those contracts and letting the games come out, even though I'm sure at some point they were looking at us in. I can't believe we're putting these two major Bethesda releases exclusively on the PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5 before we even get it. We have to wait 12 months for these games. But, you know, that's how things ended up playing out in the end. So, yeah, I feel as though while there will be some immediate releases, particularly with like Game Pass editions, this is a long term deal for Microsoft where we might not be able to truly see its impacts until you know, potentially 2025. It all depends on what games are currently in development, what type of contracts have already been signed, and will Microsoft honor those contracts, and so many other factors that are not public knowledge and such. So, yeah, this is more of a future thing. The immediate impacts, be it go through or not, will generally be minimal. But if it goes through, Game Pass certainly will get a boost in terms of software variety. If it doesn't go through, Microsoft likely has a contingency plan in place where they have other third parties, indie games, as well as first party games to keep the system and the game pass model attractive to the consumer core. Yeah. You're absolutely right. I mean, look, it's, it's going through, you know, I mean, I'm sure that they have come up with a contingency plan, a backup plan if it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. But you know, the other thing we have to remember is Microsoft is, is very hands off. They're this big behemoth, you know, Xbox, They didn't really get involved with a lot of these acquisitions, not just the Bethesda one. And they've been criticized for that as well, you know, like letting things go too far. And and then when they finally get around to seeing the work that's being done, it's not, it's not in a shippable state or it's not ready or whatever. And I think that's not going to change with Activision. You know, Activision is a company that is, I don't know how many employees they have, probably 10,000 employees, and that's just a guess. But they have a lot of people that work there. They have a board. They have um, executives. They have leadership. They have developers, QA, everything, right? So Microsoft, while they have their, their – obviously they have their roadmap of what they want to do with, with Activision, ABK, they're going to let – the studio that the publisher run themselves. Now, the million dollar question though, Nate, is this. Do you think Bobby Kotick is going to stay um, for a period of time, basically giving him that golden parachute or that carrot where he's being incentivized to stick around for another X number of million dollars? Or do you think as soon as the deal is done, he's kind of being ushered out the door and he's packing his belongings? I think he's out the door the second Microsoft has control. See, I thought about this. I'm not suggesting that he's going to stay for another year or so, but I feel like he's going to stick around for a little while longer. I don't think it's going to be the, 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 the moment it happens. It would be great if it does, but I think that he's going to stick around just a little longer than people feel comfortable with. And it's probably going to affect Microsoft negatively, I guess. But as long as there's a commitment that he is he's done, um, I think that should be fine. Yeah, I I think he's gone immediately, and I think within the first twelve months, you see a considerable area within Activision seek union ship, mm-hmm. and Microsoft will permit it. We've just saw that with, I believe, it was Bethesda. Yep. Where the employees were seeking a union and Microsoft said, by all means, we're not going to prevent you doing this. And the vote went through. I believe we're going to see a similar thing happen with Activision. Bobby Kotick will be removed and all of a sudden you're going to have a domino effect that I think could, you know, 
change the industry as you see more and more developers seek out unions and better their workplaces. So it'd be interesting, you know, to see that kind of begin yeah. with studios under Microsoft's ownership where they're going to say, because I feel as though if Microsoft allows studios under their umbrella to seek out a union mm. and they are hands off and they allow it to go through more and more companies are going to be say, we're not, we don't want to be the ones to say no. Right. Cause it reflects badly on us. So I think change within Activision is going to be huge and it's going to be felt almost immediately when the deal is done. I think change is, is, is inevitable. It's happening. I just think it's going to take a little longer than day one. But we'll see. We'll see what we'll see how it plays out. This year is going to be uh, an interesting year. I think it's Microsoft's biggest year in a long, long time. Yes. And with you saying that, it's perfect time to begin the first party discussion because Microsoft has a lot in they terms do. of first party games that have some have been announced for 2023, others are still way off in the distance, but they have a lot of games that we know about, but have not come out and may not come out for a while. But in the first half of 2023, officially, what Microsoft has communicated is that we will see Forza Motorsport, Redfall, and Starfield released on the Xbox line of consoles. And we are expected to see updates on Forza and Redfall in the Microsoft event that may be officially announced before this episode goes live. If not, it should be announced soon after the episode is available. And the show will be at the end of the month from Microsoft where we will get updates on those games. Redfall is expected to come out in May, a little later than internally projected, which was originally April, but nothing too significant. Forza remains undated, but does appear to be on track for the first six months. So I'm going to go right to the major release. Starfield, a game of great debate as to when will the game come out? When will we see it? And will it live up to the hype and expectation? So MVG, when will Starfield release? Well, we've talked about this before. We just, I think we were talking about this back in November last year, maybe December. Definitely one of the last episodes of last year. But I felt like that Starfield is not the first half of 2023, even though Microsoft has announced that and has, I guess, low key doubled down on that as well with, you know, with the information about um, Starfield coming out. It's still slated for first half of 2023. I think it's not going to make the first half. I think it's going to be available in the second half of this year. And I'm going to say September, October timeframe. Now, I could be way off base here, but I feel like Starfield is one of those games. And I said this last time um, when we talked about this, that they have to make sure that this game is buttoned the F up and ready to go. None of this Bethesda jank that we, that we associate with these types of games, the uh, fallouts and the fallout 76s of this world. This game has to be 100% buttoned up. Not not hundred percent. Let's we'll say 98.7% buttoned up and bug free and all the systems are working and all the quests are working and all the side quests are working and none, no T posing characters and no clipping through the world and stuff. All the <laughs> things that we were, you know, that we associate with a, a launch Bethesda title from Todd Howard. This is going to be the, his magnum opus. This game is going to come out and it's going to be polished. And for that, I think they're going to take that extra bit of time to ensure that it's it's rock solid. So I feel like it's going to slip out of the first half of this year into the second half. And I think they're going to probably get it ready for, like I said, October, September timeframe. I feel like that's when Starfield's coming. 
Interesting. I know there's been a lot of debate over when the game will come out. And just this past week, the support page for Starfield went up and it still said first half 2023, Mm -hmm. which is expected. They're not going to announce a delay or anything like that on the support page before they officially communicate a change of plan. I you just have to wait for that tweet. Now you have to wait for that tweet where Phil Spencer's out at Bethesda. Ooh. You know. <laughs> if if we see those tweets, then <laughs> buckle up. So my expectation for Starfield is we will see the game in the first half mm-hmm. with its own dedicated presentation where we will get a deep dive into all the game's mechanics, a look at the gameplay, the narrative, the characters, space, exploration, all of that, everything that's going to make Starfield, Starfield. But the game itself is going to come out in the second half, but not as as late as you have it. I'm thinking the game's is only going to slip a very minor bit i'm thinking you're thinking more summer. along i'm thinking summer yes yeah. at the latest you know mid-september but mm-hmm. at the earliest i could easily see it being second half of july so anytime between second half of july yeah. through mid-september is when i am expecting starfield to release now i don't consider that a oh my god this is this is a detrimental delay this completely changes the landscape of microsoft 2023 because you could view that as almost a strategic marketing delay redfall is coming later than originally anticipated so now you may want to reposition starfield for maximum impact Mm -hmm. not only for game pass but also just for the consumer market of where do we want to slot this could we release it in june more than likely they could if they wanted to. But you just released Redfall. Forza could be, could also be very close yeah. to that window as well. And you don't Forza, want to oversaturate. I mean, Forza, Forza's also a racing game as well. Right. And I, I love Forza and I love Gran Turismo. But uh-huh. th- that's a niche, you know. The, a lot of right. people are, are not even going to play Forza because it's not their type of game. Mm-hmm. I think just from the optics point, though, you don't want a deluge of software releases all from Microsoft in that short window. Absolutely. You went from starving yeah. to here's a smorgasbord of offerings. And it's like, Whoa, right. wait a minute. And if, and if the rumors are true that we are getting like a, we'll say a, a developer direct every quarter, mm-hmm. then they have to you know, ensure that we have a constant drip feed of games that are coming up, up and coming games. Right. And that's where you can come out with, you know, two or three major releases in each quarter and you space them apart because one game that is, it's not being discussed largely because Microsoft can't discuss it yet because the exclusive terms have not expired is that we are, I'd say it's a 99% chance that Ghostwire Tokyo will release on the Xbox and Game Pass at the end of March, almost exactly one year after it came out on the PlayStation 5 because the deal has now would then be terminated. But Microsoft cannot say that until the deal is terminated. Right. So if you look at the first six months of the year, you'd have Redfall, Ghostwire Tokyo, Forza Motorsport. Now, you would also have games on Game Pass, like we touched on from third party. You Mm -hmm. have GoldenEye should ideally be out before June, considering in September they said it was coming soon. Yeah, I mean, if it's not coming out, um, by then, then <laughs> coming soon is the most is the most false statement yeah. I've heard. That's coming absurd. soon in the gaming industry has lost all meaning. <laughs> At that point, if you see a trailer that says coming soon, just say, yeah, I'll see you in a year. Yep. And Hollow Knight is expected to come out within also that 12 month window. So by June. And, you know, that's that's a good six months. And that's not including Starfield. Right. Now we enter the second half of the year. And we know Forza Horizon 5 has an expansion coming out this year. Yep. We know Halo Infinite is getting an update in March. Yep. Flight Simulator it continues to get updates and, you know, new content. Mm-hmm. 
So Microsoft is going to have a nice steady flow of releases, but we're going to have those two major AAA releases finally. And now all of a sudden we're in that second half, the back half of summer, here comes Starfield. Now, yeah. by positioning it in that summer, you know, September slot, it suggests that Microsoft will then have a holiday game. Right. Which, for me, my prediction would be enter Hellblade 2. Yeah, Hellblade 2 seems like there's a lot of buzz about that game coming out this year. I'm going to throw a curveball at you, though. What about Stalker 2? Where does that fit? Does that fit in 2023? That is an interesting one because we just got an update on that a couple of weeks ago, right? We just had mm-hmm. a new trailer drop. Yep, and it and was, looked incredible, by the way. It did, especially, the way the game looks. especially considering the development circumstances that the dev team has been facing throughout Absolutely. 2022. I think that game could come out this year. And, you know, I think that would be a great moment of, you know, victory for the development team if they're yeah. able to launch the game this year. And we really have no reason to think it won't come out in 2023. It was already delayed due to the Russian invasion. So the fact that they were able to give us an update that looks so promising and they were so forthcoming with excitement, I think, you know, that's probably second half of the year. Yeah. And when you pair that with like Hellblade 2, Microsoft is, you know, they're, as we said at the start of the show, the gears are now turning. This, it isn't the greatest year in turn, you know, Xbox history. No. But it's definitely quality. Not. It's, yeah. we're seeing what they can do. And then we're going to have like the June showcase. So let's assume for this predictions start of the year episode that they do the 12 month window again. Yep. So they're going to show games second half of 2023, first half of 2024. That is the perfect chance for them to give us a new look at Obsidian's Avowed. Mm-hmm. Potentially give us another look at The Outer Worlds 2. Yep. Fable and Perfect Dark, I don't think we would see within that 12-month window. So I'm not expecting them to be like shown in June if they do the exact type of format they had last year now if they omit that format and they go over something more akin that we've seen in previous years then yeah i could see us getting updates on fable and perfect dark and especially fable i feel as though maybe they want to get ahead of it and give us some new information as you saw this week some developers from playground games who were pivotal to forza horizon 5 have left the studio they have created their own studio you had the complete nonsensical rumor of fables switching engines and somehow completing development in 23 <laughs> months despite completely restarting from scratch that but was absurd it, it was absurd but every time matt booty talks about fable he says i want to show this game yeah but the developers don't want to show it yet so it feels as though it's a case where they're working on the game they know they're in a good state but they're saying we don't want to show it yet just in case something happens and we have to come forth like Starfield and say, we have to delay the game. Let's wait until we know we're in a good place and we'll show it to you then. And that's that's smart because let's say Starfield does come out summer 2023. Unfortunately, the headlines are going to be Starfield delayed again, even if it's only a two to three month delay. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But like, I feel like, and this is just how I feel, but I feel like if Starfield comes out in 2023, like it's, that it will, then it doesn't really matter where it fits in in the calendar year. Right. It's a win. Yeah, it's a win. And that's, that's all they need. Microsoft just needs Starfield to come out this year. Yeah. Now, if you have Hellblade 2 there as well, And, you know, there's going to be other first party games that, you know, maybe there's smaller titles or there's going to be those third party games that haven't been announced yet for 2023 that could come to Game Pass. I think overall. It's going to be the strongest year the Xbox Series hardware has had to this point. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what Microsoft that's what Microsoft needs right now. They need a reason for people to get vested in the system. Because this generation, it's hard to believe, the generation started in November of 2020. Yeah. 
And I, Nate, that's why I think that these first party games, you know, even the delay of Redfall for a couple of months, whatever, um, Starfield, I feel like, again, is later this year. Microsoft can't afford to have a unfinished game release day one because that's how you lose your audience very, very quickly. You know, there's even though Game Pass is is obviously a fantastic service that they've built, I think there's also pressure on themselves, on first parties, to offer a experience that is rock solid day one. Because if it's not, you, you, you've lost people. And when you lose people, then you lose subscribers. When you lose subscribers, you lose money. And I, I feel like they are basically polishing these games up as best they can to have them ready on day one. Yes. And I I've actually have wondered if Microsoft, this is Microsoft's direct impact on Bethesda now. Yeah, this it's, is, we're finally starting to see the, you know, the, mm-hmm. the return on investment, if you will, of the, yes. the, the million, the, sorry, the billions of dollars they spent acquiring <laughs> the company. And I wonder if Microsoft has been, there have been, they've been more hands-on with Starfield where they're looking at saying, we can launch this. Yeah. But if we give you three more months, can we iron out all of these issues? And it's, yes, we can. Let's do that. Right. We could get away with it, but let's not. Let's release it. Let's release this game so it gets a Metacritic of 95. Yeah. It's game of the year discussion. It lives up to the hype. It's going to change its genre. It's going to be the RPG of the generation. Yep. And let's make that reality. And that's what I believe that is what Microsoft's goal is with Starfield in 2023. They, mm. they, they want it to be that game. Yeah, we haven't is, had that game from Microsoft in a long time. Absolutely. This is, this is probably the biggest game of the generation. And I know, you know, I know that that's a little naive to say that because we were only, what, two and a half years in or whatever. But it's, it's their biggest game of the generation. Because I feel like if it's successful, and I think it will be, and it reviews well and it's a good game, then they've set themselves up for success for many, many years. If it's a middle-of-the-road, low-80s Metacritic game that... You know, um, a lot of people like, but a lot of people just don't care about. You know, that may be a different conversation, but I do think it's it's going to be a big game. I think it's going to do well for them, and it will set themselves up for success going forward. Mm-hmm. Now we're going to do some predictions of reveals or re-reveals for 2023. So we kind of touched on it briefly with like the June event, but let's assume the June event is you know, better than last mm-hmm. year in terms of overall scope. So here's some of my predictions of what I think we see from Microsoft this year in terms of a new announcement. I believe that it pains me to say a Gears of War collection will be announced by Microsoft in 2023. I don't think a Gears of War collection exists even though uh, my good friend Special Nick says it does, I don't think it's real. But we'll see. I, I think in 2023, Microsoft will announce a Gears of War collection. I'm not saying it's going to come out in 2023. Mm-hmm. I think they announce it. It will be Gears 1 through 3. Is it Unreal Engine 5? 5? Yes. Okay. Because those were all UE3, except for the Gears of War Ultimate Edition. Right. When that came to Xbox One. But I think the original trilogy gets the UE5 treatment, potentially is announced in 2023. We were reworked multiplayer, but with feedback. So mm-hmm. they can, because if you ever played the original multiplayer of those three games, the multiplayer was different across the board. Two yeah. was a downgrade. Yeah. The shotgun barely worked, and your character could trip if it got hit by a smoke grenade. One was basic perfection. Three got closer to one, but kind of was a mix between two and one. So I think that gets announced this year. Um, And this is 
well into existence. We've yeah. seen Platinum Games publicly plead with Phil Spencer and Microsoft to give them a second chance on Scalebound. Mm-hmm. You Actually, think scale I, bands I, 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 coming I back? I couldn't see that. You know, <laughs> that, I think that's going to be a prediction for 2024. I couldn't see them already announce it in 2023 with the way Microsoft's Dude. been announcing games that still haven't had release dates or second showings. I think scale band is dead. <laughs> I don't know why we keep bringing this game up. Hope. I mean, there's definitely, I mean, there's hope, right? <laughs> Every once in a while, you know, it trends again and there's conversations around it, but oh. I don't think so. I don't think scale bound is, is is a thing. <laughs> Hope though. Yeah. Probably <laughs> 2023 is probably being a little too ambitious on that one. Yeah. But Gears Collection, I think, is a nice 2023 fit. We also like the coalition we know is working on a new smaller IP. So I wouldn't be too surprised if we finally saw that get revealed this year. We have to get an update on Avalanche's contraband. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like I said with Fable. Maybe we get an update on that, not necessarily at June. It all depends on how that show is formatted. But maybe, you know, a second half of the year, if Microsoft continues to do their own showing, that they just give us a quick update and a status report on Fable and Perfect Dark. We know yeah. nothing about Ninja Theory's Project Mara. That's completely in the dark since it was just casually announced on their YouTube channel. Um, I think it's going to come from id Software. They're going to just come out and, and, and drop a, a new Doom game or maybe a new Wolfenstein oh. game. There's, you know, there's been rumors for years about a new Wolfenstein game. I think, I think it's got something. They're cooking something right now because they've been very, very quiet for, a, for a, quite a while now mm-hmm. since Doom Eternal on the Switch really was... Well, actually, yeah. Panic Button did that. I mean, they did most of the work on that. It's, it's kind of been very, very quiet. So. Yes. I think they got something something planned. That's probably the, the the announcement for me. Gears Collection would be, I mean, that would be really cool to see. I have trouble believing that it's real, and not because you know um, of, of what may be considered rumors and stuff like that. It's really more about why do we need the Gears Collection? I mean, sure, you mentioned the multiplayer, you know, to, to standardize that across games in the same oh. fashion as Halo, but Gears still looks pretty damn good, man. Like all the back compat games still look fantastic and they're yeah. all up and everything. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a hard sell for me to, to say to do that, but hey, you know, they did it with Master Chief Collection. It was, uh, was um, a success for them. Eventually it was because it, it didn't launch very well. It took a while. But yeah, I mean, Gears Collection, it... You can't rule it out. Let's let's put it that way. But I don't believe that it exists personally. <laughs> I'm going to say that it's going to it's going to surprise us with something new. Do you I mean, think we get an Indiana Jones trailer in 2023? So I mean, that's a good question. I mean, you talked about the June showcase, and I agree with you that I do feel like they're going to stick to the same plan of we're going to show you the next twelve months. However. Mm-hmm. I feel like they're going to relax that a little bit and maybe open up five to seven minutes and just tease, just tease, you know, some longer term things. Because I do think Microsoft needs to be more transparent with everyone, especially after the Game Awards debacle where they didn't do anything or say anything at all. And I, that was very disappointing. Now, whether that was um, for for external reasons, whatever, I don't know. But they really need to let their fans know what's happening with these big games. And look, we know that Fable is not coming out this year. We know Perfect Dark isn't. But I do think we'll hear about how those games are progressing this year. And hopefully we'll see some in-engine type stuff as well. But, you know, if they can modify their June showcase format and just ha- give us a peek of, of what's, you know, longer term, that would go a long way to really get fans excited over the future of Xbox. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things like I believe avowed is going to be a first half 2024 release right now. 
Yeah. So if the June showcase continues to do the next 12 months, we would get the update on Avowed. And we would yep. see it. So, you know, that'd be very promising. Titles like Fable and Perfect Dark would continue to elude us. And I think that would be problematic for a lot of fans that it's just another case of you announced these games so long ago. Why aren't we seeing it? And that's where I also think why Microsoft needs Hellblade 2 out for this holiday. That was the first Series X game we saw. Yeah. We saw that at the Game Awards 2019. Mm -hmm. It's time. I mean, I know I there was the engine it. swap and everything, but well, yeah. it, you know, we need that game now. Yeah. Then we saw it was in 2021. We saw the gameplay demonstration at the Game Awards. You know, it's kind of hitting the case of enough's enough. Yeah. I don't want I don't want Microsoft to turn their shows into a repeat of the pre, you know the prior year with the right. same talking points and games. Twenty twenty three has to begin to move forward. Show us updates on those announced games as well as new games coming from their in house studios, be it id soft like you mentioned, and all those. You know how many developers that they now have in house twenty three. I think it's more it's like 26 or 27. They have a bunch. Yeah, they have a lot. And yeah. it's time to see what all these teams are up to. Yeah. So 2023 has great potential. A lot of it will come down to how they position the June showcase. And if we do get quarterly updates with these Xbox developer directs and how they want to format the show. But right now, you know, it's tough to predict when we don't know how the June showcase is going to go. Yeah. But overall, I mean, I think there's a lot to look forward to in 2023. If you're an Xbox fan and a Microsoft fan, we are going to get updates on a lot of these games. A few of the games will still continue to elude us, but there's promise in the air. Mm -hmm. Starfield is getting near. Forza Motorsport is, you know, essentially around the corner. Redfall, you know, it's definitely a wild card in terms of if it's going to appeal and how the gameplay is going to resonate with individuals. But, you know, the game can be out in as little as the next three to four months. So a lot to look forward to. Let's see how the Xbox Direct is in a couple of weeks at the end of the month. See if it sets the tone for 2023. As it's, you know, as we know right now, it doesn't appear Starfield will be there. It's not a doom and gloom scenario there that the game isn't, going to be at that particular showing it's better suited for its own showcase so it doesn't overshadow everything else being shown but let's see how microsoft opens the year with their first you know show in quite some time and see if they can spark excitement from the yeah. xbox community how do you think the year's going to go um i know it's the million dollar question right now but um give it a give it a a a letter grade your prediction for this year if starfield delivers on the hype and it launches in a high quality state you know no bugs or any performance issues if redfall is even an 80 metacritic yep for the motorsport you know just achieves par mm -hmm. for that franchise um we get updates on titles like Avowed, Hellblade 2 comes out this holiday, or even, you know, potentially maybe in swap those two, Avowed comes out this holiday, Hellblade 2 early next year, just, you know, as a prediction. Uh, if we get that, if that happens, we continue to see Japanese support come to Game Pass with like Yakuza, the Persona franchise, maybe something from Square Enix, stuff from Capcom, obviously big indie games like Atomic Hearts, Hollow Knight. Uh, we get updates on contraband, things like mm -hmm. that. I think overall, Microsoft's 2023 could land itself at a solid B+. I'm hesitant to give it an A only due to the uncertainty of how they will kind of... Yeah. The uncertainty of how they're going to approach their June showing if i knew for certain it's going to be the next 12 months i would adjust my grade accordingly but right. right now i come in with b plus only because we don't know how they're going to handle announcements yep. throughout the calendar year but in terms of releases it has incredible potential i agree b plus is a good good letter grade i would give that as well 
if everything that they say they're going to do this year delivers when when it when it does, then they're in great shape. And I think a B plus is a good score. It, it it's, still, it's certainly not you know the best. They could they could definitely do a lot better. But with what they have and what they're going into the, with for this year, and this showcase, you know th- this uh, this January showcase really is going to determine. Uh, in many ways, what kind of year uh, Xbox is going to have. And maybe, you know, we should have waited for that before we give it a letter grade. But I think, you know, <laughs> there's there's a lot here to be excited about for mm-hmm. the first time in quite a while. So if you're an Xbox fan, um, you know, buckle up. I think it's going to be a good year. Yeah, I, I feel as though this is, it's probably cliche to say, but I feel as though 2023 is going to be the year where the Xbox series truly launches. Yes. Yeah. I mean, in many ways, the generation has barely begun, you know, and, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, finally we're starting to see, you know, the generation start now and I'm, I'm very excited for it. So let's go Microsoft. We're giving you benefit yeah. of the doubt. Giving you the benefit of the doubt. I know we've been you're very critical <laughs> of of you, especially in the last six to twelve months. But you, you deserve know, the crit- you deserve yeah. the critique. A- absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and you know, this is time. This is their time to to really take front and center stage and yeah. show us what you got. And I mean, I think we're coming in with very realistic expectations. We're looking at games that we have seen time and time again over the years. The games that have internally, publicly been dated for 2023 we're not coming in with any way out there expectations of like fable and perfect dark everything coming out in 2023 we're realistically looking at the best lineup they could possibly offer in 2023 based on what we know yep and i think this is a very level-headed expectation for them in 2023 and they just have to deliver on it because i I really can't see major delays happening to this lineup. If anything, we could only see stuff get added to the year, not out of the year. Hopefully. But now we can go into some of the Streamlabs questions that we have accumulated over the holiday break. <laughs> and our first question comes from Jackie G, who donated a dollar and writes, got to be honest, I'm not a huge fan of how anniversaries are milked. In the games industry. However, the highest rated game of all time turns 25 years old next year. And honestly, that feels like a big deal. But does, Nint- but does Nintendo do anything to celebrate? I believe that's Ocarina of Time. Yeah. And I guess they'll celebrate by giving you Tears of the Kingdom. Yep. <laughs> yep. Another Zelda game. Hell yeah. What a better way to celebrate Zelda than with another Zelda. Ben had a $3 donation from Baron, who writes, Hello, kind gentlemen. If you could get a studio owned by Nintendo, even the internal teams, to develop a game for yours, an entirely new IP you have in your mind, which one would you choose and why? Thank you in advance. Keep the podcast rolling. Hmm. Who would you pick? Who would I pick at Nintendo to develop the game in my mind? EAD Um, or Intelligent System? Actually, is Intelligent Systems a Nintendo studio? Technically, Technically they're not. Yeah. They're technically that second party situation. Right. Um, Maybe EAD then? I guess I would do EAD Tokyo. They they do the Mario 3D stuff. Um, There's a lot of talent and. Then again, you could do next level games. Could do that and, and um, make another Luigi's Mansion game. That'd be cool. It's tough. Yeah, I mean, every Nintendo studio has their own strength. So I guess it would come down to what game I'm looking to. We could do create. next level games and have them rewrite Mario Strikers. Yeah, I'd want them to make a good soccer game. Yeah. <laughs> That's harsh. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but fair. <laughs> and a dollar donation from Solier, who writes, Hey, Nate and MVG, love the show. So interesting and revealing to hear your thoughts on industry happenings. Bat chest, I know it's been two times around with Scarlet Violet, but have you seen the mod for 60 FPS? 
No shade to Game Freak, but that was quick. LOL. Uh, I haven't. I mean, I've seen the articles about it. I know that with an overclock switch, you can smooth out the frame rates of that game as well. I haven't seen it. I um, mean, but I'm not really surprised that such a mod exists. We know, and we've talked about the development issues of Scarlet and Violet, well documented. Haven't seen any real meaningful patches yet. Hopefully we will. But yeah, 60 FPS is a taste of what could be if Nintendo, or if and when Nintendo gives us some new hardware. So we'll have to wait and see what happens there. I'm willing to give Game Freak right now the benefit of the doubt, give them until March to see if they can release a meaningful patch for the game. With my yeah, luck, this episode kinda, will air and they'll release a patch 10 minutes tomorrow, after you hear yeah. this. You kind of get the feeling, though, that they're preparing a pretty big one for the next one. But you're right. It, it, they'll probably drop a patch like when this episode goes live. Yeah, because when we were critiquing the game, they patched the game last time. Yep. Thank you, Game Freak. They then had a $3.66 donation from South Coast Horizon, who writes, recently got burned on a creative project that I liked, but had bad management. MVG, how do you deal with this when making a game? Um, Bad management, wow. I'll tell that boss to fuck off. Well, I mean, I think, you know, bad, bad management is always a problem and it doesn't have to be necessarily just in the video game space i think if you have a bad manager no matter where you work it can be to the detriment of of you know the project that you're working on or whatever you're trying to accomplish um what advice can i give i mean look i've always been someone that's been very transparent and open about um you know timelines and and things like that i feel like for me what what's always worked is you know, call out any red flags that you see. Don't be one of those people that is afraid to, you know, speak up. Um, uh, I've worked with people in the past that have, you know, have that fear of talking to management about a problem because they don't want to, uh, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not really sure why. Maybe there's some type of fear there or something like that. But um, no one likes to be told, hey, you know, we need another X number of months you know, for this game to come out or whatever um, and try to be as transparent as you can and try to have the appropriate receipts or the appropriate technical information uh, as well, ready to ready to kind of explain why, um, you know, things are the way they are. I mean, that's, that's probably the best advice I can give you is that just be open and honest about it. Um, I think if you, if you continue to collaborate with your management and let them know, you know, a good manager will know day to day what's going on, what you're working on and, and what 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 is blocking you, if anything. But, you know, you want to make sure that you constantly feed them with with updates and make sure that they know exactly where things are at. So they're not blindsided. I think that's the key thing for me. I'm always reminded of a story my father told me when he was just starting in his career field of construction. He worked at an architecture firm where he had to redraw blueprint plans and he did the drawing. It took him half the day to do one. His boss came in and said, all right, that looks perfect. I need three more copies by the end of the day. My father said, this took me half the day to do one. At best, you'll get one more before the day is over. He's like, maybe I can do two, but I can't give you three. Yeah. The boss said, well, I need three. My father said, can you do four in a day? The guy said, yes. He said, okay, then you're a better man than me for the job. And he quit. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I've, I've seen things like that happen in, in my time as well. You know, it, it's it, it, the, the key thing here is don't set yourself up to fail, you know, right. set yourself up for success. And mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, management don't like what you have to say. But as long as you're transparent and as long as you, you know, back up what, what you're doing with, with some hard numbers as to why things are going to take as long as they take, um, you know, no one can, can really dispute that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and it really, at the end of the day, it's up to management then to, to make a, a judgment call on that. And that really determines whether the management is, is good or bad. You know, if they've truly got your back on something, then they're going to go into bat for you. 
um, with discussions they have with whoever publisher or third party that they're dealing with or whatever client they're dealing with. But if they don't and, you know, there's there's managerial bonuses, like, you know, riding on some of this stuff and we've seen all that stuff happen before where managers, you know, want to want their bonuses and they want to make sure that, you know, the project is delivered on time and all that sort of stuff. They're not looking out for their team, you know, the best interest of their team, especially if there are some underlying issues that need to be addressed that may potentially cause a delay. So mm-hmm. I know we've rambled probably longer on than we need to, but I guess, you know, the, the, the takeaway is just be, just have an open and honest conversation or open lines of communication with, with your manager. Um, and if you feel like they're not giving you the same amount of respect back as to Nate's point, then maybe it's time to, you know, dust off the resume and, and start thinking about um, another opportunity somewhere else. That's my, that's just my personal thought. Then had a $3.16 donation from Retro Tux. They write, in the last trailer for Final Fantasy 16, it was mentioned that the game is PlayStation exclusive until 12-31-23. On which other platforms do you expect the game to launch? Do you think we will see an Xbox version or even one for the next Nintendo hardware? I right now only expect final fantasy 16 to come to pc i would assume yes. epic game store will probably do another 12 month deal yep. to keep it exclusive to their storefront but i don't expect it to come to xbox or nintendo in the immediate future after the deal expires i agree with that i agree with that then had a dollar donation from liam werner writes if a new Smash or Ultimate port would require renegotiation of third-party contracts. What's stopping Nintendo from just releasing updates for this game on the next gen, assuming it's back compat? I don't uh-huh. think it's likely, but is it the same game so they could? It Technically, that would be a workaround. They, yeah, they would just have to give whatever the contracts stipulated in terms of royalties per copy sold so that would be a workaround to keep this game going forever <laughs> a lot of assumptions that the next the next nintendo hardware is going to be backward compatible by the way i have um, some thoughts about uh, that but we'll we'll talk about that <laughs> when the time comes yes different topic for a different day <laughs> And then had a follow-up dollar donation from Liam Warner, who says, when talking about guest character contracts in Smash, is it not possible for Nintendo negotiated for third-party fighters and Ultimate to come back later as well? After all, that happened with Bayonetta, Cloud, and Ryu, since Ultimate was already planned then. They can have those types of negotiations in the contract where they could even stipulate a year and, you know, one or two releases of a game. Um, it all comes down to how the contracts are worded and worked between the companies. So it is possible such wording is in the contracts in Smash Brothers Ultimate that they could potentially have approval to use the majority of their roster in a new game. It's best to assume they don't have that just to keep expectations grounded than to go into the next game, assuming you're going to have Cloud and Sora and all yep. those characters make an appearance, because in reality, you probably will never get this lineup of characters in a game again. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think that's that that's the, the way to go. Mm. That had a $3.18 donation from Retro Tux. So since I asked my first question, the Final Fantasy Pixel Remaster Collection has been announced for every platform except the Xbox. So asking in general, what is going on between Square Enix and Microsoft? Why are so many Square, Square Enix releases skipping the Xbox platform? It's more than likely a game to game situation um, with Final Fantasy VII Remake. That's just Sony doing everything they can to prevent the game from going to Xbox. They had the exclusive agreement for 12 months. They then extended it an additional six months, I believe, when Intergrade came out. And at some point, 
it just doesn't become a worthwhile project for Square Enix because you can look at it and say, we're not going to have this game out for another year and a half. At that point, it's three years late. The interest in the game has likely faded on the platform. It's no longer worth our investment. The return on investment is going to be minimal. In the case of Final Fantasy Pixel Remaster, you can even look to Octopath Traveler 2, which Octopath Traveler 1 came to Xbox and the first game didn't come to PlayStation, but now the sequel is coming to PlayStation, but not coming to Xbox. It could just be a case where Square has seen results on the platform and said this isn't in our interest right now, or Sony, Nintendo, an external party is at play trying to prevent releases from coming to this platform, or Microsoft isn't negotiating hard enough to get some of these games on there. There could be any number of reasons, but it's definitely project to project. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's no technical reason why... Pixel Remastered couldn't go run on Xbox. I think you're right, though, that it's probably somewhere in between the two things that you said. Um, I think that Microsoft ultimately maybe hasn't pushed hard enough to try to get it on their platform. Is is for me? That's what I think is is the thing. But we don't really know. At the end of the day, you know, um, there's been some JRPG type releases that have already come to Xbox that have done moderately well, we'll say. But yeah, the whole Square Enix Final Fantasy thing on Xbox, man, I don't know. You know, I that would be a pretty huge get yeah. if they got the Pixel Remasters, but you know. It's yeah, it's tough to tell. It could come down to as, you know, maybe silly as it will sound, it could just come down to a regional loyalty thing where they pledge yeah. more commitment to Nintendo and Sony because they are a Japanese company. They've worked with them for a long period of time. Microsoft mm-hmm. is more of a convenient opportunity when it's right for them. Yep. But it's hard to know. And again, it's definitely a project to project case. It's not as though Square Enix is completely done with the Xbox and we're never going to see a Square oh, Enix no, game no, on no. the platform. Yeah, this it's is not... Just, Right. This is not like a boycott or they're, they're not interested in using the hardware. Yeah. You're right. It's, it's a just, case by it's, case thing. Yeah. Is Sony actively trying to prevent a release from coming to the system as we saw at Final Fantasy VII Remake? And I would almost assume that they went out of their way with Final Fantasy 16 to prevent it from coming to Xbox as well. I mean, 15 came to Xbox. It actually had a pretty decent selling percentage on the Xbox. So like Sony is very likely aware of that. And they're like, no, we're not sharing you again. Final Fantasy is ours and we're going to keep it that way. And if we have to pay Square Enix to do it, we will. We then had a $3 donation from Shirtkov. I believe I said that right. If I didn't, I apologize. Merry Christmas to the cast. My question to you is, what do you think keeps Bayo 2 and 3 from coming out on other platforms? Bayo 1 and Wonderful 101 were eventually ported to PC and PS4. How are the newer Bayos different? So Wonderful 101, Nintendo, I believe they kind of gave up their ownership of the Wonderful 101 IP, and they gave that back to Platinum. Nintendo never owned Bayonetta 1. That is Sega's. So with Bayonetta 2 and 3, Nintendo technically licensed the games from Sega but because Nintendo is publisher, Nintendo owns the content of the games. So they own the code. And Nintendo would have to give permission to port Bayo 2 and 3 to other platforms that are non Nintendo platforms. Because yep. Nintendo, at the end of the day, owns Bayo 2 and 3, despite Sega owning the Bayonetta IP. Mm hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a mess. The easiest way to yeah, explain it. It's a mess. I mean, I feel like this is one of those situations, like right now everything's cool, but I feel like it's one of those situations where it's going to end up like no one lives forever in like 30 years from now. Oh, yeah. Where there's like multiple companies that have some type of piece of the game or the IP. Mm. Uh, we'll see. see. See, that's the thing that's funny with Bayonetta is because technically there's nothing stopping... Let's use Sony or Microsoft in this case, just because you brought up the PlayStation. 
from them licensing the Bayonetta IP from Sega and going to Platinum to make a Bayonetta game. That would technically be allowed. They could do that. And it would just confuse things even more. Because Nintendo has no ownership stake in the Bayonetta IP itself. They simply just license it. Yep. Ben had a $1.42 donation from Zoobmer. Writes, can you suggest some good narrative adventure RPGs? Narrative adventure refers to Telltale, Quantic Dream, Don't Nod style games, which are focused on writing and story choice above all else. Yes, I would recommend Pentiment and the other Xbox game As Dusk Falls. Very similar to Telltale and Don't Nod style games. Was he specifically asking about Xbox? Didn't specify a platform. So this, I know this is the elephant in the room, but I'm going to say God of War Ragnarok because the story in that game is incredible. (laughs) Put it on easy mode, put it on easy mode and just play the game and enjoy it for the story because it is really, really good. Recommend me a Telltale light game, God of War. <laughs> <laughs> Just play Ragnarok. You will love the story. It is it is so good. It is so good. <laughs> does it have choice? No, it does uh, not. Kill your son. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's not. There's, there's none of that in that game. In the game, no. and if there was, it it wouldn't affect the outcome of that mm. story anyway. But. <laughs> then had Just a follow up. <laughs> From Zoobmer of $1.69, writes, the RPG part of narrative adventure RPG refers to character builds involved skill skill checks similar to what you would see in an Obsidian or Larian game. So I I guess God of War fits, but yeah, Pentiment, which is from Obsidian. Yeah. Um, Yeah, As Dusk Falls. Uh, Maybe you could look into The Quarry. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's a good one. It's very similar to uh, Until Dawn. 80s style campsite. But yeah, consider any of those three might suit your taste. Then had a $100 donation from the Zelda Sensei. And they write, hey, it's been a minute since I've donated. Hope you both are well. Now that 2022 is over and we are in the thick of the current gaming generation. What is standing out to you about video games landscape today compared to generations before? Hmm. Well, I think for me, it's, you know, the high cost of, of development, the, the extreme budgets and the amount of time it takes to make games anymore. I think for me, that's that's the big thing. We're going to see some really amazing things this this generation, but we're going to have to wait a lot longer to see them. And we've already experienced that, and I think it's just going to get worse over time. I think the rise of subscription services. That's a good one. Game Pass set the tone. Yep. Now we see other companies looking to replicate it in their own unique way uh, with Sony introducing their subscription tier service last year. We know it's going to continue to expand. Nintendo will likely expand NSO in their own way. And in a way, it kind of feels as though subscription services are going to become more prominent in this industry moving forward. And I think that's something that is definitely standing out in the landscape today versus prior generations because an idea like Game Pass would have just been viewed as an impossibility even yep. 15 years ago. Then I had a $5 donation from Baron. Right, hello, gentlemen. No question here. Just a wish for the new year. Be healthy, patient, and keep up the good work. Thank you very, very Thank much. You. Appreciate Thank, it. Thank you. And our final Streamlabs question for this episode comes from Liam Werner, who donated a dollar and says, is there anything in a Switch cartridge software wise different between regions? I know the Switch is currently region free, but given Nintendo's weird history 
of flipping on that, I was worried that my three Switch EU carts may not work on a Switch 2 in the US. I mean, at this point, you can only assume. Yeah. But if if Switch 2 remains region free and compatible with the Switch game cards, there's no reason that your out of region game cards wouldn't be compatible with the Switch 2. Yeah, I agree with you. I just, again, this is another episode. Is it going to be a Switch 2? <laughs> is it really going to be a Switch 2? Find out we'll on find a it. future find Nate the Hate in, episode. <laughs> yes, in the future. <laughs> <laughs> but as our final stream labs for this week, if you'd like to support the channel, we have a stream labs link in the description below. Donate any dollar amount, ask a question, we will answer it at the end of the episode. Donate $100 or more, and we will dedicate the episode to you. And if you like the video, please give the video a like and subscribe to the channel if you have not already. Let us know your thoughts on Microsoft's 2023 in the comment section below. And today's episode, once again, is dedicated to the Zelda Sensei and Shamsa. And I'd like to thank my co-host, MVG, for joining me as always. Thank you, Nate. It's a pleasure to be back with you this year. And um, yeah, thanks for having me on as always. And we will be back next week with an another predictions episode for 2023 for which company you'll have to find out then but until next time continue to embrace the hate